So tonight is our culminating event for the fellowship year. Um, and this year actually marks the five-year point since our first class of Margins Fellows began in 2014. And we were doing the math recently and counting up years, and we realized that 2019 also marked um, 20 years, sort of non-consecutive years, but 20 years of the Asian American Writers Workshop offering fellowships uh, to emerging writers of color. It's a pretty tremendous history. And um, so the Margins Fellowship is an opportunity for emerging Asian American poets, fiction writers, creative nonfiction writers to receive guidance and support for their creative practice, to build community with writers here at the Asian American Writers Workshop, and to make a home for their work on our online magazine, The Margins. The, in, to, in this past year, in 2018 to 2019, we've been supporting four writers through the Margins Fellowship. Each of them has been at work on a book length project. They have each re received a $5,000 grant to support their work, publication opportunities, residency time at the Malay Colony. Some of them are about to go there later this summer and into the fall. Um, they've received writing space um, here in our offices through the year and mentorship from writers and editors. And over the course of their fellowship year, our fellows meet one-on-one -on -one with their mentors and they get to work on their book-length manuscripts and also just talk about the writer's life and much more. And we're just so grateful to our mentors for the time and work they do in guiding our writers into creating a life, um, a career, and a community as a writer. Tonight's reading is really special because it brings together many generations of Margins Fellows or of members of the workshop community. A lot of the uh, mentors this year have been a part of the workshop since its very beginnings. And we're really excited for those relationships to continue to grow. Um, you'll be hearing from both our fellows and our mentors tonight. And we just want to say that we're so, so proud of these four writers and just really grateful to bring them into our community. So we also um, want to extend um, thanks to the staff and interns who are working tonight's event. Tiffany and Rob on our, our programs team. Um, our interns, yes, please. Um, our interns, Christy, Ruth, um, or interns and volunteers, Christy, Ruth, Amy, and Felicia, who actually closed out their internship with us today. Um, and Sophia, who's our former programs coordinator, is here staffing the event, and we're so happy to have her here. Um, and also a thanks to all of the funders who have really made the Margins Fellowship possible. This includes the Jerome Foundation, the Nathan Cummings Foundation, the New York Community Trust, the Serdna Foundation, and individual donors, as well as those who've contributed through our fan club. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do this work. So I really, really appreciate it. And um, finally, a big thanks to our mentors again for their time and commitment. And, and most importantly, to the fellows for just giving so much to this space and giving so much to each other. I think it's been extraordinary to be working with you this year. Um, so a couple notes about our format tonight. We're going to be um, coming up to the stage as, as co-hosts, each of us, to in introduce one of our mentors. They'll read, from, uh, they'll, they'll read for about five minutes, and then they'll be introducing the fellow that they've had a chance to work with through this year. Um, and then we'll do that twice. We're going to take a short five-minute break after the second pair, um, just so that we can stretch a little bit. We'll be back after that five-minute break, um, have two more pairs of readers, um, and then we will break for celebration cake and for you to have a chance to um, buy some chapbooks in the, in the back. And so I just wanted to um, take a moment to talk a little bit about what's in the back table. So last year we started a tradition that we really hope we're able to continue into the next few years with the Margins Fellowship. We designed a small chapbook that features excerpts from some of the work that our fellows have been working on uh, through the year. And so we, um, uh, this year's chapbook features a cover illustration by the artist Jia Sung. Um, the interior was designed by Emma Liu, who's one of our designers um, who's been on staff. And we're really selling those chapbooks for $5 in the back. They're really beautiful, um, and they're really just an incredible memento, not only of this night, but also of all of the work of the fellowship and, and these four writers. Um, so yeah, so I think we just want you to sit back and relax, and we're going to get started. Um, our first reader tonight is Sonia Chung, who has worked with Jen Liu this year as a mentor. Sonia Chang is the author of the novels The Loved Ones and Long for This World. She's a staff writer for The Millions, the founding editor of Bloom, 
and is a recipient of a Pushcart Prize nomination, the Charles Johnson Fiction Award, the Bronx Council of the Arts Writers Residency, the McDowell Colony Fellowship, and a Key West Literary Seminars Residency. You can read Sonia's work in the Three Penny Review, Tin House, The Huffington Post, BuzzFeed, and several anthologies as well. She's taught fiction writing at Columbia University, at NYU, at Gotham Writers Workshop, College of Mount St. Vincent, and Warren Wilson's MFA program. And Sonia lives in New York City and is now writer in residence at Skidmore College. So I, um, we asked the mentors to just send along a couple of lines of, of writing advice so that we could have their um, voices kind of woven into the intros that we offer here. Um, writing advice that's stuck with them, that has been meaningful, or maybe writing advice that's sort of been surprisingly meaningful to them. Um, so Sonia wrote back and said, you know, both of these um, pieces of writing advice I read in interviews, she said. I came across um, after her MFA in her early 30s when the literary world was feel, feeling kind of hipster oppressive and she was trying to find her own path. The first one is um, by Tan Dan and it goes, if you become too sophisticated, you lose courage. And the second one is um, from Marlon James, advice that he received from Colin McCann and it's, Risk sentimentality. So please join me in welcoming Sonia Chang to the stage. First of all, just bear with me. I always, where is the full house? I always <laughs> it's such gold. Like, who are all you people? And what are you? Sure, where? Let's see, I gotta do this. Hi, thanks for having me. It's kind of weird, like nerve wracking going first with such a great lineup of folks. Um, so I'm just gonna try to get to it as quickly as I can here. Um, what do I wanna say about this? I'm reading from, first, oh, first of all, let me just say this. It really is this whole generations thing. It's like one day you're 20-something and you're sitting in a writing workshop at the Asian American Writers Workshop, like learning to write fiction or something, and the next you blink your eyes and, oh, guy, I published a book and I get to do my debut reading at the Asian American Writers Workshop. And then suddenly someone's calling you and asking you to be a mentor <laughs> to somebody. <laughs> and you're thinking, oh my God, am I that old, first of all? <laughs> and do I, I mean, do I have anything to offer? You know, am I really a mentor? So, but it's really an honor to be asked, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I'm just reading from a, a long personal essay that I've been working on for a while that I've recently finished, an unpublished essay. Um, it's called Yielding to Beauty. I'm just gonna read a quick bit, hopefully quick. Um, and I'll just say that this essay is about my personal journey in reconsidering the relationship between feminism and beauty. So. In the wee hours of the night, I watch YouTube tutorials created by girls named Lynette and Pixie Woo and Bun Bun. With their delicate French manicured hands, they proffer close-ups of products and tools that will transform narrow Asian monolid eyes into bigger, brighter ones. I learned this new term, monolid, along with hooded and hidden, and lean in closely, squinting my narrow Asian eyes, sometimes rewinding to catch the techniques. There are many steps, multiple implements and products, different effects for different occasions, cat eye, smoky, etc. I jot down on a sticky note the names of brands recommended by more than one video girl. Four videos, and an hour later, I sit back, massage my neck, blow out a hard exhale. I am 45 years old, and for reasons I feel newly compelled to better understand, I have never before worn eye makeup. I click on a link to an article called 34 Monolid Makeup Tips You Probably Haven't Tried Yet. 34! <laughs> with photos and illustrations. The writer's voice is peppy and empathetic, addressing the reader as fellow monolid, and after describing a frustrating eye makeup challenge, cutting to parentheticals like, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we are legion, it turns out. We have the small, lidless eyes. I read through all, 43 all thir 34 tips. It's late and my monolids are growing heavy, but this is fascinating <laughs> stuff. 
vertical gradient shadow method, floating eyeliner method, tight lining and primer, natural dramatic and sultry effects. I am fortified by the prospect of experimentation, but also overwhelmed. Before shutting my laptop, I click a mini arsenal of products into my Sephora cart, quickly, lest I talk myself out of it, and I hit purchase. Then I reopen my laptop and cancel the order. It will be faster to go to the store. The next day, I acquire an eyeliner pen, a lash curler, mascara, a three-toned shadow kit, eyeshadow brushes. I try not to spend too much, but then fight myself about skimping. It's summer, hot and humid, and I soon learn that smudgy raccoon eyes are the bane of the monolid. In an email to my sister, who is always more current in matters of fashion and beauty than I, I slip in a question about eyeliner. She is quick to write back. Liquid, waterproof, she says, indestructible, and names a couple of mainstream brands. Off to Duane Reed, I go. When we were growing up, my sister was the funny one. I was the smart one. Our oldest sister was the pretty one. She bought handfuls of red plastic pencils from People's Drug and thickly lined her eyes, also monolids, every morning with black coal. It was the Denise Huxtable look, raccoony by design, a little punky but glamorous too. Neither of my sisters wears much makeup anymore. It's ironic, I suppose, that I'm starting now. Maybe the word I'm looking for is inevitable. In middle school, superficial and shallow were the rallying cries of the nerd class and the sad girls, of which I was both. We lobbed these insults, see in your mind our girly throws, at the popular crowd, and thus were we vindicated, destined for greater things. That vindication, however, was itself superficial, because what we were not, in our depths, in our souls, was consoled. Perhaps we were rewarded or acknowledged in sundry ways, teacher's pet, academic awards. And yet still, we were not seen. What is woke, after all, about invisibility? In the US, what we perceive as beautiful, what holds currency vis-a-vis -vis -vis female visibility, has mutated, continually mutates, in relation to culture, Western culture. We know this. There is the classical beauty of ancient Greece, based on symmetry and golden proportions, fair-headed, statuesque. There's the dramatic, voluptuous beauty of 50s starlets, a partial resurrection of the ample, fleshy bodies and blushing good health of Renaissance women, or the exo exoticized beauty of dark eyes and hair set against either porcelain, East Asian, or dark, African, Latin American, South Asian skin. There is the wizened or ethereal beauty of elder women, mothers, and saints, the demure, coquettish beauty of the ingenue, the boyish allure of the 20s flapper, the ragged, wild beauty of the waif, on and on. We are all influenced one way or another. If you're the smart one, you try to situate yourself intelligently amidst all this imaging. Your job is to buck the beauty standard in whatever iteration. For my part, I seem to have unconsciously laid claim to effortless as the superior brand of beauty, an honest and authentic outward presentation that involves no styling or illusion or adornment. The most artful beauty should be artless, aloof to the prejudices of culture and society, shouldn't it? Take me or leave me, I have determined to transmit. I am not the pretty one, I am the smart one. This is my lane. I have worn my unconcern with beauty like a badge and uniform. It's what smart women do. But what smart women have yet to do is wrestle thoroughly through the contradictions. We are transfixed by idealized beauty. We adulate its avatars. Smart women wear lipstick and high heels and color their hair and diet and do hot yoga and spend money on manicures and skin care. But we're still not supposed to. We deem this guilty pleasure, professionally obligatory, or necessary therapy. Or we keep silent and affect unconcern with beauty and its imaging. But in closeting our native, vital craving for beauty, we enact the hypocrisy of the Victorians, who expected women to look perfectly composed and attractive, but never as if they were trying. Thanks. OK, maybe some of you related to that. Um, so I'm going to introduce my mentee, Jen Liu. Um, as I said, I was a little, had to kind of get used to the idea of being a mentor. Um, and meeting Jen kind of uh, deepened that anxiety <laughs> to some degree because I would, describe, I would describe lovely Jen Liu up here 
I'm going to coin the acronym, or maybe it's already one, I don't know, VPT. She is very put together. <laughs> she is poised, she is clear about who she is, her path, her goals, creatively, professionally. She has an MFA from Hunter. Um, she has been awarded many residencies and fellowships. She's just good at what she does. She is much more stable than I was at her age. And I thought, oh God, what do I have to offer her? What's this, how's this gonna go? Um, <laughs> <laughs> then as we got to know each other and we talked more about where she was in her work and what she was struggling with, I remembered that really the most reliable features of a creative life are uncertainty and messiness. I'm very good at those things. <laughs> I actually have some good experience with messiness and uncertainty, and I thought, okay, I can, I can help with this. <laughs> um, and interestingly, we did get to talk about some of those things, about how um, Jen works in numbers. She works as a bookkeeper. She likes it when things add up, but how in the writing life this is very, yeah, there's so little you can control. So um, that, that sort of became a lot of what we talked about. Interestingly, we had a lot of subject matter convergence in our work, but I am primarily a fiction writer, Jen primarily a nonfiction writer, and yet throughout the year, she was started writing fiction and I started writing more nonfiction, and she's going to read in fiction tonight, which is amazing. And so um, I have had the privilege of um, reading uh, more of, I think, more of what you're going to hear tonight. Um, and it was really amazing. It, you're in for a treat. I won't give, it too mu give away too much. Um, she's written this beautiful, insightful portrayal of a young woman who wants some certainty and some clarity, <laughs> but who is swimming in some very murky relational and cultural territories. Um, and it makes sense to me that Jen would render the experience of murkiness and messiness with such delicate precision, while also wading into this territory of fictionalizing hybridity, fiction and nonfiction, and sort of messing it up. So without further ado, here's Jen Liu. Woo! So smooth. <laughs> nice. All right, I'm going to readjust a little bit, do my thing. Um, hi, everyone. How are y'all doing tonight? <laughs> this was a, a, we had a performance workshop before this to teach us how to prepare for this. And uh, one of the jokes was that we should start off with the how are y'all doing tonight? I, I feel like I didn't really hear enough from you guys. So I'm going to do it one more time. <clears throat> How are y'all doing tonight? Good, good, good. Cool, cool, cool. Um, first of all, I wanted to say a quick thank you to Sonia for being an amazing mentor, to Jothi and Yasmin for doing everything for us, um, and to my fellow fellows. We'll talk after. <laughs> okay, so um, as Sonia wonderfully said, I am going to be reading an excerpt of a short story titled Many Mansions. Um, all you really need to know is that Julia is a writer who's returning to Beijing for the first time in 10 years on a writing residency. It's the city where her family is from. And uh, before she leaves, she gets involved in a sexual relationship with Colin, her friend's ex, um, and a man that she knows from college. Uh, the excerpt I'm going to read is a flashback scene um, that takes place after Colin and Rebecca, who's Julia's friend, um, have already broken up. And uh, Julia is encountering Colin again for the first time after several months of distance. Many mansions. You're not very nice, Colin said to her once after a night out drinking, just the two of them. It had been a year since the breakup with Rebecca, and all three maintained a distant but steady friendship. Julia was stung by his words, but she tried not to show it. 
What I mean is that you have more interesting qualities than being nice, he said. What's not nice about me, Julia asked. The din of the bar rose up around her, and she could feel herself growing shy, reddening into her drink. It's a compliment, he said, reaching across the table to place a hand over hers. His palm was damp from clutching a mug of beer. You're honest. Being honest is a good thing. Julia was not used to the sensation of being watched. As a child, she often felt like she had no stake in any given situation and relegated herself to the position of an outsider, a referee sent to enforce the rules of the field. Love and romance were for other people. She was flattered by Colin's attention, even though she didn't agree with what he saw. The fact that he had tried to understand her at all seemed remarkable, something worth rewarding. The night Colin and Julia had sex for the first time, he had been hosting a barbecue at his apartment in South Slope. Rebecca was out of town for the week, visiting family. As his housemates roasted corn and grilled hamburgers, they all talked about approaching their mid-30s, still young, but with the sense that things were not as free and open as they used to be. That night, Julia was the last to leave. She hung back in the kitchen as Colin said his goodbyes, slowly finishing a bottle of lukewarm beer. After the last party-goer had left, he approached her with a tired look and pressed his face into her neck. His lips felt surprisingly full, pillowed against her collarbone. When they finally fell into each other, she heard him exhale a sigh of relief that matched her own. As they took off their clothes, she noted the, match, the patch of hair on his back and the tiny belly that hung over the waistband of his jeans. She loved how sex turned him eager, the look on his face both concentrated and boyish. And, as often happened in the lead up to having sex, she was most excited to see herself reflected in his desire. He kissed her with force, his tongue pressing deep into her mouth, and when he came inside of her, she felt his whole body shudder, a complete letting go, his breath an all-consuming pulse in her ear. In the morning, she woke up to find his arms around her. They had slept together naked, cradled like that all night. This touched her so much that for a moment she couldn't speak. Moisture prickled at the corners of her eyes. He woke up slowly and smiled at her, pulling out his phone to play her a Neil Young song, a continuation of a joke from the night before. As they lay in bed together, she cataloged the thin red rash across his chest and the smell of her own morning breath. She made up an excuse not to stay and left the apartment before either of them was fully awake. When they met for drinks a few weeks later, she carefully picked out her outfit and underwear, hoping that they would sleep together again. He chose a restaurant near his apartment and surprised her by wanting to order a four-course meal. Their conversation wandered naturally, as it usually did, from art to books to film. Eventually, they circled around the subject of romantic love. How do you deal with the disappointment, Julia asked, after the beginning of things. Colin paused to dip a piece of bread into the dish of olive oil between them. I think the disappointment is necessary, he said. He chewed slowly, methodically. It's like praying the rosary, he said, a journey in stages. It becomes a choice whether or not you decide to see it through to the end. Colin often said things like this, statements that were unprompted and had the appearance of being slightly profound. Instead of responding, Julia took a sip of wine and stared out into the restaurant. She caught the eye of an older white woman who looked at them appraisingly. When Julia frowned, the woman gave her a slight smile of encouragement. It made Julia feel strange to the, the eye of this sort of appreciation when she was so used to feeling unseen. It was easy to think that this was all because of Colin, whose handsomeness seemed to be a quality integral to his personality, like other people's shyness or humor or self-deprecation. He wore it on his sleeve in the way that he was easy with other people and the way in he which he would look at her from time to time, cock his head to one side and ask, what are you thinking? To show that he could be observant 
as much as he was used to being observed. <laughs> she wondered if it was thoughts like these that made him think that she was unkind. They ordered opposite items on the prefix menu and shared. The night was not going as planned, and Julia felt nervous. She gripped her hands around her napkin and twisted it from time to time, feeling the tension in her shoulders build, then ease. She thought desperately about being in bed with him again, about being taken away from the swirl of thoughts in her head. Halfway through the meal, Colin got a call on his phone and frowned. I have to take this, he said, before placing an earbud into his ear and walking away. He blocked her path to the bathroom, so she settled for pouring herself another glass of wine and adjusting the fabric of her dress across her chest while she waited. Who was it, Julia asked when he came back, his t-shirt slightly crumpled with sweat. Rebecca, he said blankly, wiping his hands on his jeans before picking up his fork again. He seemed distracted, pushing the food on his plate without bringing it to his lips. I'm sorry to do this, but I'm going to have to cut things a bit short, he said after a beat. She wants to see me tonight. Julia felt her heart drop. About what, she asked, trying to keep her voice calm. I didn't know you guys were still talking. Colin shook his head, irritated. I don't know, he said. It's only recently, but it looks like tonight is the only night that she can meet. She's meeting you at 8.30 p.m. on a Tuesday night, she repeated. She could feel the blood rushing to her ears. A feeling of anger and embarrassment flushed through her. Colin looked down at his plate and then back at her. You're not going to sleep with her again, are you? She blurted out and instantly wished that she hadn't. She felt sweaty and out of control. She wanted to challenge him to see him lose his cool a bit. Most of all, she desperately wanted him to stay. Colin looked surprised, then laughed. I'm not going to do that, he said. Julia watched as he sat back slightly in his seat. He stared at her for a moment as if trying to puzzle her out before pouring herself pouring himself another glass of wine. Is that what you really think of me? Yes, Julia said, without pausing. They were both silent as Colin seemed to withdraw within himself, thinking. Julia couldn't meet his gaze, so she focused on a corner of the table until he was ready to speak again. Want to make a bet? He asked finally, grinning his lopsided grin. Julia felt the tension diffuse a bit. Colin had a talent for this. Sure, she said, trying to match his lightheartedness. But are you sure that you have anything that I really want? <laughs> he smiled at her from across the table and poured her another glass of wine. I'll bet you my firstborn child, he said, that I won't sleep with her again. I don't want any children, Julia said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, he said. Only books, right? Later that night, she got a text message while reading in bed. I won the bet, smiley face, he wrote. You owe me dinner. When Julia read the words, she felt a sharp pain in her belly, a whoosh that told her that she was both sad and relieved. She made herself wait 15 minutes before texting back. <laughs> You're a grown-up now, huh, she wrote. How are you feeling? Sad, he said. She watched the ellipses bubble back and forth as he drafted his next few words. I think I'm going to have a hard time sleeping tonight, he wrote. Are you going to have a hard time sleeping because of me or because of her, she wanted to ask, but she couldn't find the courage to write the words. Instead, she put her phone down and pressed her fist into her stomach to staunch the ache that she felt there. The mental image of a Colin who was not quite Colin a man with Colin's featured features but molded to her specific wants and needs, overwhelmed her and made her feel safe. She had trouble imagining the logistics of a real relationship between them, the fights and irritations, Rebecca and the potential ripples in their social pool. Still, this didn't prevent her from imagining what it would be like to wake up next to him in the morning, to feel his gaze fixed on her, in a way that would propel her from the sidelines to the front of the field. On their final morning together, before Julia left for Beijing, Colin prepared two glasses of iced coffee. He worked in a desultory fashion, pausing to hum the bars of a song 
or purse his lips in thought while rummaging for milk and ice cubes. When he handed her the glass, their fingers touched. You have really lovely hands, he said. He glanced at them admiringly. Julia smiled and took a sip. Piano hands, she said, 13 years. She did have lovely hands. It was one of the small things that they could both agree on. That was amazing. Um, let's give another round of applause for Jen and Sonia. <laughs> so our next reader tonight is going to be Ava Chin, who worked with Pik Xuan over the course of this fellowship year. Ava is the author of the award-winning memoir, Eating Wildly, Foraging for Life, Love, and the Perfect Meal, and she's also the former urban forager columnist for the New York Times. She's written for the Washington Post, the LA Times, Marie Claire, and the Village Voice. And she's also the recipient of grants and fellowships from the New York Public Library's Coleman Center, the Fulbright Scholar Program, NIFA, and the Asian American Writers Workshop. She's an associate professor of creative nonfiction and journalism at CUNY. Um, so Ava's writing advice actually comes from a pencil. <laughs> uh, from BinderCon, which had a quote from the writer Terry Jones. Um, and the advice is very simple. It is, just write the book. <laughs> Please welcome Ava. Wow, it's so fantastic to be here. Hello, Asian American Writer Workshop family. <laughs> How y'all doing? <laughs> You did a great job. What? I can't hear you. How y'all doing? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, it is thrilling to be able to uh, read here tonight um, and to be introducing Pic Chuan uh, momentarily. Um, I was a uh, writing fellow uh, here at the workshop. 20-somewhat mm, years ago. Um, so it's, uh, it was thrilling uh, when you asked me uh, to do this. Um, so uh, I'm going to read you um, an opinions essay that I had written for the Washington Post. Um, and it's about one of the very first stories I ever learned from my family that my great-great-grandfather worked out west on the first transcontinental railroad. Yuan Sun, along with tens of thousands of other Chinese workers, blasted tunnels, carved footholds, and laid grade at death-defying heights through the most arduous parts of the Sierra Nevada, miraculously making it out alive. I envisioned him tough and swashbuckling, a cross between my tall gambler gr bartender grandfather, who often told me these stories by, while smart, smoking a Marlboro in our, flushing home, our home in Flushing, Queens, and Yosemite Sam. My great-great-grandfather and his fellow laborers toiled around the clock in rotating shifts drilling tunnels, handling explosive nitroglycerin, hauling tons of rock and dirt, even and upwards of 30 feet of snow. They endured brutal working conditions we would consider unconscionable today to complete the most difficult sections through the Sierra Nevada, the same terrain that stopped the ill-fated Donner Party in its tracks. And finally, out to Nevada and Utah's blistering desert heat. They were paid less and worked longer hours than their Irish or American counterparts, and they had to provide their own food and accommodations. Although some claimed it could never be done, Yuan Sun and other Chinese workers completed the task in record time. It wasn't until, as an adult, I traveled out to Promontory Summit, Utah, and saw the site of the railroad's completion with my own eyes that I realized the true weight of this legacy. The railroad, you see, is a complicated affair for Chinese-American descendants like myself. The greatest U.S. engineering feat of the 19th century may have physically unified the country when it was finished in 1869, but this new network of rail also brought scores of white workers to the West. 
many of whom who grew resentful when they saw Chinese holding down jobs they considered rightfully theirs. Not 15 years after the completion of the railroad, this ire, coupled with a severe economic depression, helped usher in the Chinese Exclusion Act, the country's first major federal law that limited immigration based on race, class, and nationality, setting the tone for future wide-reaching, restrictive immigration policies going forward. My great-great-grandfather was a teenager when he arrived in California, a mere boy, one of upwards of 20,000 Chinese, mainly from the Pearl River Delta area in Guangdong province, who made up the majority of the Central Pacific Railroad workforce. He, like most of the others, were raised in a poor farming family in a country that had been hammered by drought, famine, Western colonialism, warlordism, and one of the bloodiest civil wars of the 19th century, conditions that would look familiar to many refugees and, Im and migrants today. So when the opportunity arose to feed his family by working for a railroad an ocean away, he took it. As a schoolgirl, I scanned the official photograph that came to symbolize the railroad's completion. Engineers, sh engineers shaking hands, flocks of laborers posing for the camera, the champagne toast, a carefully choreographed scene. More than 100 years later, searching for faces like my great-great-grandfather's. Only white faces stared back. Chinese workers were written out of this triumphant American story. Their contributions were already being erased when Chinese exclusion was enacted and soon followed by a tsunami of anti-Chinese violence that swept across much of the West. Lynching, lynchings, expulsions, boycotts of Chinese businesses, politicians jumping on the bandwagon, nativism was as popular and potent then as it is today. Yuan Sun, now an entrepreneurial shop owner who also had a gambling den in the back of his store, had happily settled in Idaho, where after the railroad's completion, Chinese made up almost 30% of the population. Although he had been living in the country for almost 30 years, one day he was forced out of his home at gunpoint by a band of masked vigilantes. I say, by the way, vigilantes, but they were masked because they were often people in the town that you knew. The baker, the banker, the judge. Despite these hardships, Yuan Sun resettled back into life in China and surprisingly spoke of the work he had done on the railroad with great pride. He even taught my grandfather his first words in English, Central Pacific, Southern Pacific, Union Pacific. My chain-smoking grandfather repeated these names back to me through his ringing Cantonese intonations in our home half a world away as if he were a conductor calling out the stations. As the Trump administration attempts to rally support for ever more stringent immigration policies, I can't help but think about railroad pioneers like Yuan Sun. These men risked their lives hammering and detonating gunpowder, surviving avalanches in extreme conditions, engaging in the kind of back-breaking, chisel-to-granite bone work that others refused to do. I am confronted by this complicated history, even as some wave patriotic flags among cries to make America great again. 150 years ago, my grandfather's grandfather did help make this country great along with scores of his countrymen. It didn't stop him from getting out, getting booted out decades later, simply for being Chinese. Thank you. So, 20-something years ago, as I mentioned, something happened that changed my writing life. I became a fellow here at the workshop, which was just the kind of confirmation that I needed uh, to show my working class family that I was a real writer. Right? Um, the workshop at the time was still in the basement of St. Mark's. It was headed by Peter Hong, excuse me. And we can fast forward two decades later, um, two moves, two different 
uh, executive directors. Um, and today we are in the shadow of Ken Chan's directorship. Um, and it's exciting to see what the future holds for the workshop. I was thrilled when Jyoti asked me to become a mentor. Um, I wasn't 100% sure if I could actually do it um, because I had so much on my plate. So I was like, oh, I was like really weighing it, right? Um, but the workshop's mission is in alignment with my own mission as a writer to write the stories that are untold, the stories that I always wanted to hear when I was a young person growing up and to support the next generation of young voices. So Pik Shen, Pik Shen Fong is an exquisite new writer, an exquisite singular new voice. I'm gonna read just a little bit part of her, um, her biography. You know, she has roots both in Hong Kong as well as Vancouver. And her writing has appeared in the margins and Rice Paper Magazine and was shortlisted for the Metatron Prize. Am I pronouncing that right? Um, She's also an artist, right? She's an artist on the page with words as well as a visual artist. Um, her work has been exhibited at the New York Museum, the Katona Museum, the Frank Institute, the Secret Theater, and at Beverly's. She has an MFA in fine art uh, from SVS, uh, SVA um, and a BA in visual art from Brown. Uh, she is drawn to experimental forms, and her prose transverses the intersections between family, material lineage, lineage and the experience of love and loss in the Chinese diaspora. Um, Pikshan, one of the things I want you to know um, is that the workshop will always be a home to you. It is a family, as uh, many of you know. Um, both the fellows as well as former fellows, um, as well as folks who just love to write and love to read. Um, and I hope that you remember this night uh, because going forward, the future is bright for you. Um, I hope you know that we were here for you uh, when you land your agent, when your book gets published and you have your party here. I will be sitting in the audience beaming at you, right? Um, and I hope that you remember this time uh, in the future when the workshop asks you to be a mentor to a bright, vibrant young voice who has a bright future ahead of him or her. So. everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I've never read in front of this many people before. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to thank Ava for being such an amazing mentor this year. And um, thank you, Jyoti and Yasmin, for being just so generous with your time and unconditionally supportive. And Aisha, Jen, and Zena for being such amazing cohort. Sorry, I'm also recovering from a cold, so You'll have to excuse my congested voice. Um, I'm going to read a short piece that I wrote about my grandmother. My papa's birthday and my birthday are only three days apart, both in the seventh month of the lunar calendar, when the gates of hell are open and ghosts can roam free. She says this makes the two of us clever. On the Gregorian calendar, this makes us both Virgos. An astrologer once looked at my papa's birth chart next to mine and told me that the synchronicity was astounding. She said my maternal lineage runs deep and that my papa and I could have karmic ties that stretch way back into our past lives. Once, when I was three and a half, shortly after we immigrated to Vancouver, my papa and my mother took me out for dim sum. As we left the restaurant and headed into the parking lot, my papa was carrying me in her arms. Halfway down a flight of stairs, she fell and rolled headfirst into the lane. Screeching to a halt, an oncoming car bore its tire down on my papa's hair. My mother was scared, seeing her mother and daughter lying there, motionless, 
scared that my little fingers had been run over. She says that my papa had curved her entire head and body around me to protect me, and that if I hadn't been there, my papa's arms would have flung out. Her neck would have been straighter, so it would have been not her hair but her head under that tire. My papa says that day it felt like she was pushed by something. She says there is no way she would fall like that on her own. Years ago, a fortune teller told my mother that spirits like to linger at busy intersections and inside parking lots. The spirits of people who died in those places, waiting for the right human match to come along to take away. That's why my family likes to say I saved my papa's life that day. But the truth is, she also saved mine. I too once fell in a parking lot. It was one summer during college when I was visiting Hong Kong. I was spending the day with my aunt Five. We had just gotten off the bus in Central, and we were walking through a big bus, a big bus terminal to get to a mall on the other side. All of a sudden, I fell forward onto my hands and knees right in the middle of a lane. As I raised my head, I saw a double-decker bus coming straight at me, and in that moment, my aunt Five jumped between me and the bus. Hands and feet out in the stance of a goalie, ready to take the blow. The bus braked just in time, and we walked away untouched. For the rest of the day, I kept replaying the scene in my head, thinking, "Could I have done the same for her?" Last summer, my mother told me that my papa had fallen, face flat on the ground, and was rushed to the emergency room. Her lip was split; there was blood everywhere. But luckily, no bones were broken. It was a few days before my papa's 88th birthday. I found out a week late because my papa made my mother promise not to tell anyone, so that we wouldn't have to worry. When I saw my papa on the video call, she angled the webcam above her nose so that all I could see were her eyes and her forehead. <laughs> she said, "Hi, my friend." I said, "Papa, I know you fell." Ah yeah, I told your mother not to say anything. Why did she tell you? I'm all better already. I'm fine. Bye bye. <laughs> Wait, I'm not done talking. Well, I don't have anything else to say. There was a large bandage on her upper lip, and later she showed me that her wrist and her knee were bruised and swollen. I asked, "What happened?" She said, "I was walking to the parking lot behind your mother." There was a crack in the concrete, and I tripped and fell. Your mother turned around and saw me face flat on the ground. She was so shocked she just stood there. She didn't even know to call 999. Thankfully, some strangers passing by saw us and called an ambulance. But I'm all fine now. Don't worry. After we hung up, I couldn't get the image out of my head. My papa on the ground, her face covered in blood, and my mother standing there in shock. I kept returning to the image of my mother. She is the one I call when I don't know what to do. She is the one who always has the solutions. I couldn't stomach the thought of her frozen in fear. My papa says that of all the people she has known in her life, she misses her papa the most. She says, "I cared about her, but I didn't know how to appreciate her. She was kind and hardworking, and she suffered so much." But I asked her to cook for me, even when she was very old. When she tells me this, she's staring at the ground, her gray-white hair backlit against the sunny window. I feel, in that moment, a feeling I cannot put into words. As silly as it sounds, it had somehow never occurred to me you could miss someone when you're that old. She has missed her papa for over 50 years, and that is so much longer than I have been alive. And one day, I too will be in her place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ava and Picture One. It was beautiful. 
Um, and now we're going to take our five-minute break so everyone can stretch their legs, get some wine and water, and also buy a chat book. And we'll meet you back here in a few moments. Those are four tremendous readings that we had in the first half. Just, yeah, really wonderful. So thank you all so much. So um, our next reader tonight is Monica Yoon, who had the chance to work with Aisha this year as a mentor. Monica is the author of Black Acre, which won the William Carlos Williams Award, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Kingsley Tufts Award, and was long listed for the National Book Award. Her previous poetry collections are Ignatz, which is a finalist for the National Book Award, and Barter. She's been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Stegner Fellowship at Stanford, and the Witterbeiner Fellowship at the Library of Congress. A former lawyer and the daughter of Korean immigrants, she currently teaches at Princeton University and in the Columbia University and NYU MFA programs, and she's a member of the Racial Imaginary Institute. The best piece of writing advice that Monica's gotten was from Young Jean Lee, who said that she likes to figure out what it is that she's most afraid of and then to write towards that. Please join me in welcoming Monica. Thanks. I love this passing on of advice because Young Jean also told me that the best piece of advice that she had ever gotten was from Mac Wellman, who had been her professor at Brooklyn College, who had said, whenever I get stuck writing a play, I just have a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church walk across the stage, which is like, okay, sure. Um, uh, so I'm, um, I'm, um, I'm moving tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., uh, and I've been uh, moving boxes since about 6.30 this morning, and since I'm an older person, I'm now in a great deal of physical pain. So just imagine that my affect level is about twice as high as it is, uh, because, you know, in all honesty, I have been so excited uh, about mentoring Aisha, about this program, which I just really think is, you know, what the Asian American Writers Workshop does best. Just, you know, to establish these connections and this sense of community uh, and to bring up new and brilliant writers. Um, so anyways, um, and I apologize for reading off of my phone. Both my printer and my books are now in boxes. Uh, so... Um, but anyways, um, so this, um, I, I wanted, I was going to read something else, but I was thinking about the conversations that uh, Aisha and I were having because I felt like we really had so much uh, on the same wavelength in terms of the same writers, in terms of thinking about issues of race and representation, uh, often across genres. And so this is a piece I wrote during the period of our mentorship relationship, and um and uh, so I had written a book. Uh, my second to last book is called uh, Ignatz, and it's based on the Crazy Cat comics um, that were published from 1914 to 1944. And you have to imagine them as kind of the original cat and mouse comic strip. Um, so basically there's this cat of uh, this kind of of indeterminate gender named Crazy, um, who is in love with this mouse named Ignatz. And Crazy is a black cat with a, uh, with a white face, and Ignatz is a white mouse. And I knew when I wrote the book that George Harriman, who was the author of the strip, had been, uh, was Creole and had been passing for white his entire life. And, you know, I made a couple of oblique references to that in the book. But then I read a biography um, of George Harriman that came out a couple of years ago. Um, in which he argues that, like, well, duh, obviously, uh, race is the central theme of this story of this black cat with a white face who's in love with a mean white mouse who loves to hit this cat in the head with a brick. And I had not realized, I think, the severity of the consequences to Harriman because, you know, it had been like, oh, he was not, you know, out... Uh, he did not. He was passing for his entire life, and you know his the, his true ancestry was not publicly known until decades after his death. And that he would have been criminally prosecuted for fraud. That he would have lost his job. That you know all. Um, and so I thought I would return to that material. Um, so this poem is called "Study of Two Fig Figures: Ignatz Crazy," and the epigraph is from Crazy Cat. You have written truth, you friends of the shadows, yet be not harsh with crazy. 
He is but a shadow himself caught in the web of this mortal skein. We call him cat, we call him crazy, yet is he neither. At some time will he ride away to you, people of the twilight. His password will be the echoes of a vesper bell, his coach a zephyr from the west. Forgive him, for you will understand him no better than we who linger on this side of the pale. One, the smaller figure is rendered as a grouping of ovals, head, torso, ears. The roundness of the ovals suggests a kind of plenty, a trove that the line wraps around protectively like a mother's arm or like an electrified fence. A circle is similarly bounded, but the radial symmetry of the circle suggests safety, stasis. The oval instead is restless, pushing against its boundary, seeking escape or release. The line is necessary to contain the oval or to defend it. The ovals of the figure evoke the pads of a prickly pear, tapering where they join together. The prickly pear defends its precious hoard of water with its long straight spines. The figure has no spines. Instead of spines, the figure has sharp straight lines that make up its arms, legs, eyebrows. The figure uses these lines to convey hostility, kicking, throwing things, expressing scorn or rage. We understand these violent actions to be defensive, motivated by fear, a belief that the cherished contents of the ovals are somehow under threat, but the ovals of the figure contain nothing. Nothing, that is, except the underlying blankness of the page. The lines of the figure separate the blankness inside the ovals from the blankness outside the ovals. We are told to read the figure as white. In order to read the figure as white, we must read the blank background as white. We have often been told that blankness means whiteness, but this does not help us understand what it is that the figure fears. Two, the larger figure is rendered as a continuous solid. Most of the solid is filled in with closely spaced lines. These lines are known as hatching or hatch marks. We are told to read these hatching lines as blackness. We are told to read the figure as black. The figure has a white face. I say white face, although the face is blank because we are told to read these blank spaces as white. The mouth and eyes are rendered as lines. Were the hatching lines to cover the face, the expression of the eyes and mouth would no longer be legible. In order for the expression to be legible, the face must remain white. The hatching lines are pulled tightly back from the forehead like the wig of a founding father. The exposed forehead arching over each wide eye suggests the possibility of enlightenment. Enlightenment is rendered as a form of blankness, the unhatched space. In order to achieve enlightenment, the hatching lines must be kept at bay like saplings rooted out to clear a field. The hatching lines are beyond the pale. That is, the hatching lines are beyond the boundary line that separates what is clear from what is not clear. We are told that the larger figure is also beyond the pale. We are told that the larger figure is drawn to the smaller figure. We are told that the smaller figure is not drawn to the larger figure. The smaller figure keeps the larger figure at bay. <coughs> if the figures were to encroach upon each other, the blank spaces would fill in with hatching lines. These spaces would read as black spaces. You would not be able to read the lines of arms or legs or features against this black background. That is why they never touch each other, because you wouldn't be able to read it. Um, and now it's... <laughs> It's my absolute pleasure to be introducing Aisha, who, you know, I feel like I learned so much from working with her, from the initial, like, you know, delighted shock of seeing uh, what she was due, how she was 
pushing the boundaries of hybridity, pushing the boundaries of what we thought of as genre. Because, you know, I had come in being like, oh, have you read, you know, Bonnie Capil? And, you know, no, no, that was her starting point. We have to go way, way past that. And, um, and so it was just really exciting to be working with someone who, you know, every conversation I felt was pushing both of us forward. And it was a lovely, uh, a lovely relationship. I mean, I have so much um, respect for the clarity with which she sees herself, uh, her practice, her priorities, what she wants from, you know, certain which phase of her literary life and what she doesn't want. She's not someone to fall into something just because other people are doing it. And, um, and I really respected that. And um, I'm, and I was just, you know, we had a great time together. And I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to stay in touch with her and continuing to have her in my life. Um, so should I read the formal intro? Um, uh, um, so from Lahore, Pakistan, Aisha Rice um, identifies herself as a hybrid, creating hybrid poetry through hybrid forms. Her work strongly revolves around issues of identity, class, and race, while possessing a strong agency for accessibility, education, and change. Uh, I felt like we also, you know, we're people who bring poli uh, policy and the arts together, um, and... Uh, that was, um, and she, uh, her, po uh, her poetry cultivates relationships between the word and image through theatrical performance, filmic visual imagery, and documentary. Uh, she's been a recent resident at the Malay Colony and has had work previously published in The Margins, Cherry Twee, and elsewhere. And she graduated from Bennington and currently lives in New York. <laughs> Hi guys. Okay, I'm glad you can hear me. Um, okay. Um, thank you so much, Monica, for your words. They, um, I have a lot of emotions today. Um, I've been looking forward to this reading as kind of like a chapter closing since it started, the fellowship. And it, I've been like in my mentally always just like curating something or the other. So it's like my mind's always at work. And like I always like lived in a way in which platforms, big platforms or platforms I feel safe around, which is, has definitely this space been um, to like do rituals or do a big thing and not just, here are my poems. Um, and I always like start with saying a little about, saying con like talking about context about both me and my poems mostly because they're just, you know, there are poems, they look so different on the p on paper, and they are so different when I'm reading them. Um, and you, as a reader, has a different experience on paper versus me. Um, so a little context about myself. I came to the West for the first time for um, university, college, uh, in 2013, uh, went to a film school in Toronto, um, hated it, dropped out three months later, uh, didn't tell my parents, took a, um, <laughs> oh, took a, um, mm, took a, what do you call, Amtrak, like applied for a visa, took an Amtrak across the border, joined in um, Bennington and Vermont, um, where I started fresh, and then I told my parents that this is what I did. Um, <laughs> Uh, and they were like, mm, mm, and then I was like, mm, but it's done now, I can't go back. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it was liberal arts college in Vermont, um, white landscape, very white mentors, that I feel like it's kind of unfair to have expected for myself to um, tell myself that I should have known better uh, in a lot of ways. So my work began to curate in a way well, a lot of my creative work began to create in a way that was I felt entertaining an audience and not really myself. So when I graduated, I was in a like the, my mental health was like, uh, who am I? What am I? And then magically, I don't know how it's still like it's still imposter syndrome 101. Like I got this great fellowship at this Asian space, and I remember like when I entered this space, and I was just like, there are so many Asians here. <laughs> And they're not even, you know, like South Asians. I'm just happy to see people or writers of color, which is like I, I wasn't in a space at all in the four years of my American experience. My I called like I'm five years old in America, my age. 
Um, so that is my context, and a lot of my work fetches from my personal um, drugs, <laughs> mental health, which is a big thing, feeling always the marginalized, which is also a great magazine. <laughs> you should have sent your work in. Um, and just like feeling the other, but instead of like realizing its external consequences, it was the self-blame. Um, the first poem, wow, that was a long introduction. The first poem um, I'll be reading um, is an acrostic poem um, from t the time I was in Toronto. Uh, it's a acrostic poem is a poem that is written in affiliation with a piece of art. Um, and I think it's, it's amazing that we can write poems that are just not about, like that can be about something or somebody else. Um, and this is about a piece by Ai Weiwei. It's a bicycle installation that he showed at Noé Blanche in 2013, fall of 2013. And it's like a big, 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 like maybe as big as, maybe double this space, like a bicycle installation in which he just like piles of bicycles on top of each other. And it's just like enormous and it's beautiful. Um, so this is a poem about that. Urgent telegram to a time being. Noé, Noé Blanche, 2013, Ai Weiwei bicycle installation. Young stop, war stop, darling stop. Climb out of what you have dug for yourself. Grow out of skin peel and worn out stop. Denim stop, darling stop. Ocean is a beautiful place to be since coming to birth in another stop. Womb stop, suddenly the Niagara Falls drain in my mouth hole stop. I hold it back and together on my tongue stop. The train takes me on stop. Hello Toronto, hello D Dundas Square. In the fall of 2013 when it was all new and without rust stop. And now the sky squeezes a rupture, stop, tries to hide a tear, stop. I see I, stop, way, stop, way, stop, piling on bicycles on top of each other without any way to stop, stop. I tried to ride off, but I was told stop. I was to not pedal off art, stop, even for home, end. Um, all my other poems are pretty new. This is kind of old. Um, this poem is called in response to Gene Wilder, who sings pure imagination dressed up as a chocolate maker, named Willy Wonka, who Americans adore without reading Roald Dahl, who was one out of the two British children authors available at the corner bookstore in Rawalpindi, where I existed in third grade. <laughs> Fingered the pill, shifted to a palm, chuck it against the wall, let it leave a mark. Full of breath, the pill with chuckle will roll around on the ground. From where I will see all the thousands of faces of my dead friends pass through my lips just to settle down in the trees. Outside my window, outside my door, my dog, Dippy, my cat, Sardines. Imagination is a scary thing, but also a choice. Without a rug, I enjoy the raw floor lying flat on my face licking dirt, the pill good and far away, unreachable and good. To strive is to never reach. I'm scratching my wrist, mumbling names of my future kids. Sara, him, Dania, Yasmin. Something that will work in every possible settling, in every in-between. I was born ready, yet I have still afforded to lose over not having a house, a man, a body, a life. My biological clock is telling me to die for what is left and what exactly is left, really, if not just for my imaginings. Um, this is the most vanilla poem <laughs> of my whole curation. It's two pages and tercets. All of my others look like this. It's like prose. Um, experimental prose poems. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, some vanilla is always good. <laughs> it's called, I grew up watching anime, which is a very foreign thing in Pakistan if you're growing up, because no one's like, what is that, the cartoons? So it was nice to be in a space where people were like, yeah, I also grew up watching anime. <laughs> so I grew up watching anime. Forgive me, Father, for in this poem, I'm trying to be Christian. To become was the first signal for these bones to call for break. In my face, everyone is seeing my mother. I must prep for war. I must cover my teeth in charcoal, bury my face in mud. 
The race is never going to be over. I must transform. Back in the day, transforming meant how little girls would lift off from the ground and spin in an elaborate sequence, where after the pink backgrounds burst into animated stars, they would emerge in slow motion, wearing tiaras and capes, holding staffs and other priestly weapons. Everyone everywhere was always saved. I must defend myself. In the south of Vermont, the call for prayer would ring for my folks' phones, and I would gather I would gather my I would gather my neck back into my fur. I only ever hold myself in high to wait for God to dig me. I must crack every dawn with a sledgehammer. I must pray. I will be a good girl. I will not eat myself into a pig. Naruto grew up with an animal inside him, and Sasuke kept losing his ability to see. All Edward and Alphonse wanted was to use alchemy to bring back the dead, and I'm not 100% confident I would not have done what Yagami Light did. Everyone turned out fine, I think. I did go to a church once, I'm not sure what kind. A white flake was put on the tip of my sour tongue, but in my stead, it was my mother's mouth that swallowed down my crimes. Um, okay, so the next two poems are very new, and they're kind of dedicated to the international student experience of being mistaken always as an American identity while all actually learning how to be American despite your race, despite your gender, despite who you are. And I think they're just like some things that you just struggle with, even if they're little things. Like I got a full-time job like a couple of months ago and I didn't know like benefits, how they worked. And I couldn't really ask my parents because they're not really here, right? And who am I asking at this point? Like, <laughs> so you know, like <laughs> your your like your like family that is here. Um, so, and like I made so many like beautiful beautiful friends that have been a part of me in the last five years that have suffered mental health issues without realizing that it is not them, but so many of the the, the reality around them. And um, my best friend, Q, um, passed away last week. And it's been a strange, strange, strange week for me. And I feel like if it wasn't for this reading today, I would not have showered. And I would not have um, had the strength to be here. And it's just like impossible for me to be in spaces like these where I feel safe and not give, like not dedicate something to the people who've actually made me, even in, in times when I felt like I was not worth it. Um, so I will be, Q was wonderful. She was an architect and she just one of the most beautiful people I've ever met in my life. And I will just be lighting a candle for her and reading the next two poems in her memory. Um, Q, wake up. How dare you fall asleep on me? Here in New York, I'm all alone, scratching my wrist and falling to song. Q, on the train to my dead end job, I see you in the tunnel walls, in the shifting deep nothings. You're dancing to Blondie, twirling full rounds, singing aloud jumping around, you have taken all my trains back to get bleached in party lights where these metal doors have re released me into a past where you strive now outside every wall, away from every dance floor, in snowy Vermont, in dreadful Vermont, the whiteness dispel us into either shadow or ghost. Q, this sleep can do none of us any good. So you must wake up and smell me and my stinking life and where I swallow down my good cells, abide well, die well. I plug my fingers into sockets, pull wires into loose shapes, wrap them around my neck. Here at my dead end job, I understand how every meaningless toss is a dance anyone can dance, that all our meaning is only full of meaning of our own create. 
Was this the kind of lament that exhausted you? Q, my mouth, my words, myself, should have built underneath your jump a net. Q, I'm wearing my surrender for you. I'm re returning this Ramadan to prayer, to surahs, to Allah for you. I'm going to spend all my money to come to hot damp Vietnam, to dreadful Vietnam, to where the sky now shelters you. Your lungs still breathe despite your attempted smother. Your wretch in December fell on my face in snow. Here in New York, the only thing we seem to share is an emptying hole, begging for new sod. Now every spring, spring brings within its own special rot. The pollen, the rain, the rising dust sees my mouth, my eyes, my lungs. I'm scratching all my skin off, Q. When you can see me, you will see me in flesh. After my dead end, I'm so lonely. All I want to do is fall asleep or escape to Blondie, to dancing, to poetry, to Vietnam, to all such things that pierce me before kissing me, before kicking me in my failing throat, out of which no words ever escape to help either your wake or mine. I feel so good to have given her some kind of something because it's hard mourning over someone you love over distance and not having closure, even like not being able to go to her funeral in Vietnam and just all of that. Um, this is my last point for the evening. In my mind, I really thought I could be really funny <laughs> <laughs> and just like <laughs> balance it out, but um, I really need to work on my humor. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, this one is called Apprehensions. Some names divide in bleached mouths. Some bodies exist in no choice. The ghost will once a body. The ghost will once a repulsive thing. The ghost and I make out on my couch. When I think of form, I think of a sack. Every sack doesn't have a fetus. Every fetus has a mother. The womb is a vessel. The womb is a home too small to climb back into. Yet in every drown, I am in forever try. Once the sky turns color, the hand rises to trace it to a horizon, only to become a shadowed fist against the light. No one believed the ghost in the corner was a good ghost. No one believed me. The water ices and then melts. The family laughs and then dies. All strangers befriend me and then line up to leave from JFK. Who wants debris where there is always rock? In the bottom of a frozen lake is my friend, call her fish. At the corner of the road is my friend, call him deer. Fallin falling asleep on a pill is my friend, call her respite. Leaving the roof, a vessel of no wing is my friend, call her off. What is there pul pulsating in the sky? My eyes are too weak to see the end to all this distance. The ghost is a forever thing. Forever is as long as me. When I think of my dead friends, I become forever not alone. In front of me is a beautiful day, genuflecting for my forgiveness. Thank you so much for having me tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aisha, for sharing that with us, and to Monica for introducing and reading. Let's give another round of applause for both of them. So tonight's final mentor reading is going to be Hasanthika Sirisena, who worked with Zena over the course of this year. Hasanthika's essays and stories have appeared in The Kenyan Review, Glimmer Train, Narrative, and other magazines. Her work has been anthologized in Best New American Voices and Best American Short Stories 2011 and 2012. In 2008, she received a Rona Jaffe Award, and she's currently an associate fiction editor at West Branch and teaches at Susquehanna University. Her short story collection, The Other One, was published in 2016. Um, and Hasanthika's writing advice um, that she wants to share with us tonight is that it is not talent alone that predicts success, but perseverance and the ability to not be thrown by failure. Please welcome Hasanthika to the stage.
Hello, everybody. Oh, better speak into the microphone. I got that in the email. OK. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. Um, I think it's, it's just such a great celebration of the wonderful work of the fellows. And I am so honored um, to be here. Um, I'm actually not going to read my work today. Um, I was on the train coming from Pennsylvania, and I thought that I have been so lucky to have a writing life, and that I owe so much of it in so many different ways that I'm not going to go into right now to the Asian American Writers Workshop. Um, and so what I want to do today, with your indulgence, is uh, to read from Kazuo Ishiguro's uh, lecture for the Nobel Prize when he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2017. Um, the entire lecture is really gorgeous. Um, I'm going to read just a short portion, the end of it, which is an appeal. Um, and I'm just going to start. So here I am, a man in my 60s, rubbing my eyes and trying to discern the outlines out there in the mist to this world I didn't suspect even yet existed until yesterday. Can I, a tired author from an intellectually tired generation, now find the energy to look at this unfamiliar place? Do I have something left that might help to provide perspective, to bring emotional layers to the arguments, fights, and wars that will come as societies struggle to adjust, to adjust to huge changes? I'll have to carry on and do the best I can, because I still believe that literature is important and will be particularly so as we cross this difficult terrain. But I'll be looking to the writers from the younger generations to inspire and lead us. This is their era, and they will have the knowledge and instinct about it that I will lack. In the world of books, cinema, TV, and theater, I see today adventurous, exciting talents, women and men in their 40s, 30s, and 20s. So I am optimistic. Why shouldn't I be? But let me finish by making an appeal, if you like my noble appeal. It's hard to put the whole world to rights, but let us at least think about how we could prepare our own small, small corner of it, this corner of literature, where we read, write, publish, recommend, denounce, and give awards to books. If you are to play an important role in this uncertain future, if you are to get the best from writers of today and tomorrow, I believe we must become more diverse I mean this in two particular senses. Firstly, we must widen our common literary world to include many more voices from beyond our comfort zones of the elite first world cultures. We must search more energetically to discover the gems from what remain today unknown literary cultures, whether the writers live in faraway countries or within our own communities. Second, we must take great care not to set too narrowly or conservatively our definitions of what constitutes good literature. The next generation will come with all sorts of new, sometimes bewildering ways to tell important and wonderful stories. We must keep our minds open to them, especially regarding genre and form, so that we can nurture and celebrate the best of them. In a time of dangerously increasing division, we must listen. Good writing and good reading will break down barriers. We may even find a new idea, a great humane vision around which to rally. I too was surprised when I got the email asking me to be a mentor. Uh, and then I read Zina Aga's bio, and I thought, gosh, uh, the role should be reversed. <laughs> um, so it's a pleasure to read this bio. Uh, Zina Aga is an Iraqi-Palestinian writer and poet from London, currently based in New York. Her work examines immigration, war, and life in the diaspora. Zina's poems have been translated and published internationally, and she's performed at universities and festivals around the US, United Kingdom, and France. She founded Warwick University's largest poetry collective, Shoot from the Lip, and is currently a Margins Fellow at the Asian American Writers Workshop working on a collection of interrelated short stories about Iraq. Her writing has been featured on NPR, PRI's The World, WGBH, El Pais, Skin Deep, and Mufta. 
She was awarded the Kennedy Scholarship to study at Harvard University, completing her master's degree in Middle Eastern Studies, followed by a fellowship at Harvard Law School Library Innovation Lab. Zina is the U.S. Policy Fellow for Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. Her writing has appeared in Foreign Affairs, The Independent, and The Nation, and media cre credits include the BBC World Service and BBC Arabic. I just want to add that I've gotten to know Zina over the past six months. I've been deeply impressed by her commitment to her writing and the writing life. She's an artist with a vision, a desire to portray, a f portray fairly and compassionately a world too often misrepresented or hidden by our larger media and culture. Please joining me Join me in welcoming Zena. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you to Jyoti and Yasmin for just making the most incredible year um, and for really giving us space to be ourselves in every sense of the word. Um, and to Aisha and Pick and Jen, it's just been I honestly feel like I've learned from you as much as I have from the things I've been reading and, and the conversations I've been having. Um, and also, thanks to my friends, because I, I did abuse a lot of you um, virtually and in person, so I'm humbled that you did come. Um, so um, this is a story called Snake Oil, which uh, is uh, a collection, one of the, the stories from the collection. And I uh, will read an excerpt from it, unless I can go all the way, but probably won't. I started dreaming about the snakes a few months before my ninth birthday. It began when Om Hamza came to get an injection from my mother. Om Hamza's husband owned the neighborhood bakery a few streets away, and she had long trusted Mama for her discreetness. She arrived on a Wednesday afternoon early in June after we'd eaten the usual fried fish. I sat on a low stool in the kitchen, sucking the last of the fishbone when Om Hamza came to the door, her black abaya flowing over her buxom figure and her large moon-shaped face gleaming with sweat. She knocked loudly on the corrugated tin of the front gate and entered without waiting for a response. My mother approached her, wiping sweat from, the forehead, from her forehead with the back of her hand, her red and white dishdasha dirty from the oil stains and soapy dishwater, her, her slippers clapping loudly behind her as she approached. The two women kissed brusquely as though picking up an interrupted conversation. I walked in shyly behind Om Hamza and came to stand by Mama's side, skirting Om Hamza yet always facing forward as if she were a planet I were orbiting. Om Hamza entered the front room and sat on the low couch, peeling off her abaya in one fell swoop to reveal a gaudy floral dishdasha underneath. The woman shared the customary pleasantries and inquired after the other's health, husband and children. As Om Hamza bewailed her second son, Mohsin, and his broken car, she untied her dark hair. Dark strands were glued to her forehead, sweaty from the hot Baghdad sun. The rest, patchily dyed blonde and hazel brown, flowed freely down her broad back. I noticed her hair tie was the elasticated top from a nude colored stocking. Mama was in, was in the adjoining kitchen, kitchen, preparing the silver tray with little, gl little glass cups for tea, tutting quietly as the mint leaves, artificial sweetener, and date-filled ma'mul didn't fit ne next to the saucers. She called out to my sister, Maha, to come down and carry the tray over when the tea was brewed. I followed Mama like a ghost into the living room. As Om Hamza laid the packaged injections on the table, she began her story of woe. Mohsin had recently had a daughter. His firstborn son had since become overcome with jealousy, and it was disrupting the balance in the house. Hmm, I saw signs of that when I went to pierce the little girl's ear, said Mama, nodding knowledgeably. Well, it's completely normal, replied Om Hamza. They can get very upset by it. I remember my younger sister trying to drown our twin cousins. We've avoided that, at least. But still, it has made the house loud, and my father-in-law is old and gets angry with us all. He says he's deaf, but he hears all the yells in the house and has made my life hell. I stopped bringing him his tea to spite him. Anyway, Mohsin, because he's a fool like his father, decided to get his boy a friend to play with. The friend, it transpired, was a baby lamb, almost newborn. They went to the market in the morning and asked, for the, asked the herder for the youngest lamb they had. And the next day, Mohsin went to collect her. This was before he broke his car, of course, she added exasperatedly. We have named her Wurud, flowers, which is funny because she has done all her business over mine. The problem, Ya Umm Muhammad, she said, addressing my mother when, with an imperious hand gesture as she shifted her weight on the sofa, is that she's caused me a rash. I think it's an allergy. 
She pulled up a colorful sleeve to, explo to expose inflamed circular spots all over her taut skin. My mother nodded and tore the injection out of the plastic casing, putting the fluid into the syringe. Maha entered carrying the large tray. At 15, she had grown into a beautiful woman. Dark, dark eyes, thick legs and full breasts, her hair black and rich as, as molasses cascading down her back. Um Hamza opened her eyes wide and said almost enviously, Allah, what beauty is this? Where did this bride come from? Maha smiled modestly as she set the tray down and kissed Om Hamza, who turned to Mama as though, Mama, as though Maha wasn't standing in front of her and said, she's grown so quickly, Om Muhammad. Is she married yet? Mama glanced back at Maha. She replied, not yet, although the neighbor's son has been pegging love letters to the washing line on the roof and I don't think he's in love with me. <laughs> Om Hamza laughs, laughed, from Hassan, I'm sure. No, his younger brother Abbas, he's as much a rascal as Hassan though. Um, Hamza laughed again, a high-pitched sound at odds with her size, then added warningly, be careful, huh? Someone will put the evil eye on her soon. Listen, she leaned forward, suddenly businesslike. I know Um Yasser is looking for a bride for her son. He's just been accepted to study engineering. This last, this last was spoken with a mixture of smug pride and envy. Mama made a non-committal noise as she signaled for Um Hamza to lift up her dishdasha and pull down her cotton pants, exposing her rotund buttocks for the injection. I looked up lovingly at Maha. I knew I would not look like her when I grew up. I knew that the neighbor would not write me poetry or call at me when I walked home from the bus stop. I knew that the shopkeeper's eyes would never linger on my face, nor that my friends would come over to secretly thread my eyebrows after school. It was her hair that made her magical. It was as thick and silken as those pictures of the Ottoman ladies in my textbook. Om um Hamza, as though hearing my thoughts, continued, what did you do to get her hair like that, Om um Muhammad? Did you use snake oil? What? said my mother disbelievingly as she, rubbed, as she rubbed surgical spirit on Um Hamza's bottom. Yes, trust me. My daughter-in-law told me it's what her people did to get thick hair, which I believe because they all have hair heavier than gold, said Um Hamza earnestly. And her people are the type with nothing better to do than but chase snakes. Maha laughed lightly. The needle disappeared smoothly into Um Hamza's buttock like a, like a warm spoon into a jar of ghee. She barely winced. She said you rub snake oil into the scalp and it makes the hair grow so thick, almost overnight. She said that some people use snake skin, but I don't know about that. Mama and Maha exchanged skeptical glances and said nothing. Um Hamza sat up and put a ma'amul hole in her mouth. She pressed one silver dirham into Mama's hand as she remonstrated that she refused to take money from friends. Once the ritual argument was over and Mama pocketed the dirham, the two women and Maha, an almost woman, sat drinking tea and discussed who came and went in the neighborhood and what to buy and cook for the upcoming Eid celebrations. I slipped away unnoticed and went into the other room where our family slept. I opened the door of the only wardrobe and looked at myself in the long mirror. The room was dim and the smudged reflection of my dark complexion made me look small among the cluttered surroundings. I reached up and stroked my hair thin as a cat's, symmetrically parted in the middle with strands tucked away lifeless behind my ears. Black, but not like Meha's. It looked faded, like a cloth that had been out in the summer sun too long. I re-entered quietly as Um Hamza was preparing to leave. She kissed us goodbye at the gate and waved her hand casually. I won't be back again for more injections. We'll eat wurud in a few, in a few months. <laughs> they all laughed and, Ma and Mama, Meha and I returned to the kitchen. That evening, I dreamed I was in a jungle. It looked like the one in the book we used for school captioned Africa. In the dream, I was wearing a new dress, similar to the ones Maha and I received for Eid, and I was running feverishly through green leaves and mulch in search of snakes. I heard a few of them twisting in the leaves, and I, I lunged forwards. They were bright and red and green, some as thick as Uncle Mehdi's neck, others as delicate as the, li as the lizards in the bathroom that made Mama scream. Perilously and provocatively, I swung repeatedly at the ground with a small branch, when I woke, I had forgotten much of the detail, but I remembered one unconquerable conviction. I had to find them. From that day onwards, I was instilled with a desire to kill snakes, to wring them dry and rub their oil into my hair to make me beautiful. The following night, I dreamt I was running across a bridge in the Euphrates looking for writhing brown snakes. I wanted to skin them and wrap, my peel around the, wrap their peel around my head like a hijab. Eventually, the dreams became a nightly occurrence. Sometimes I was abroad from what I'd seen on television, or deduced from Uncle Mehdi's stories, but for the most part, I was in Iraq. I was always in a boundless expanse, a forest, marsh, or desert, and always alone. Once I awoke convinced it had worked. 
I shuddered with a start from a particularly vivid dream and found long locks of hair and a halo around my head on the mattress. Giddy and disorientated, I scrambled upright to the mirror, only to find that it was Meha's hair that had strayed into my territories, falling territory ter tendrils falling onto the ground. I started to stare at girls in the street, those of whom were uncovered. It rapid. It rapidly developed into an obsession, and no woman escaped my envious eye. Whether long or short, straight or curly, styled or loose, I yearned to touch it, to rub my cheek on it, to drape my head, to drape it over my head like a shawl. I did not share my desires with my mother, not since I asked if we could find snake oil when we were in the market buying fish, and she laughed outright. When Baba brought home a grainy black and white television, I would sit immobile in front of it, watching the monochrome sun reflect off the Europeans' honey-coloured hair in films. They looked like everything Mama said happiness was. I also watched Egyptian women sing to heartless men, their thick black hair swaying pendulum-like as they periodically chased or ran away from their lovers through Kyrene streets. While my obsession and my dreams fixated on the acquisition of snake oil, I occasionally pondered what to do with it. How to apply it was a common concern. Did I just rub it in once? Or did I have to do it every night? What did snake oil smell like? Was it like concentrated henna-like paste? Was it black, like the pool of oil underneath Uncle Mehdi's old Chevrolet, or slick and orange like cooking oil? When I joined Meha School, I noticed that all the older girls who laughed the loudest and had the largest circumference of friends always had magical hair, as did the girls who were engaged. Meha joined their ranks as she approached the baccalaureate, but the Christian girls unquestionably had the most stylish hair. Religion was not mandatory for them, so they would spend their free periods trying out different hairstyles and applying makeup in the bathrooms, giggles swelling into the corridor. But no matter how many pins I stuck in my hair, ribbons I tied around my plaits and, band I wrapped, and bands I wrapped around my knot, they always looked too large for my head, as though an exotic bird were perched precariously on my scalp, and I felt eyes looking at me contemptuously. I thought back to the trips to the hammam with Mama before Baba installed a bathroom for us at home. All the women had thick hair. I wonder whether they rubbed snake oil into the triangle between their legs to make their hair so coarse. When hair started to grow between my legs a few years later, a few years after the dreams began, I worried that they too would be thin as a cat's hair and lie limp. I made a point of checking them every time I went to the bathroom. Around the time the girls in my class started to bleed, I derived a savage pleasure when some of them turned up with headscarves over their heads, often under pressure from parents. When my own older brother told me it was time to cover my hair, I vehemently protested. I had not worked so hard, and for so long, only to have my soon-to-be exquisite hair covered up. For no matter how many seasons passed, my conviction that my hair would transform and that snake oil would be the means of its transformation never wavered. I studied biology at El Monsanceria University, alone among my, among my parents and siblings to attend university. By then, Maha had moved to Nejef with her husband and an to an unassuming na man named Lislan. Saddam Hussein had become our new leader and veins started to swell on the backs of Mama's hands, crisscrossing like train tracks. I estimated that the number of snake dreams I'd had had grown from hundreds into thousands. Although I often captured the snakes, bludgeoning, bludgeoning the brittle crown of their head, I awoke before applying their juice to my hair, like a lemon that falls too soon from the tree. When we stumbled into war with Iran, I began finding snakes on the battlefield, writhing under the corpses of young men or else slithering in the desert with distant silhouetted onlookers like mirages. When missiles rained on Baghdad and Um, and um Hamza's bakery were shelled, I dreamt I was ro roaming it, with snakes appearing like weeds from the concrete, their fluorescence juxtap juxtaposing with the grey of the concrete. Every night I dreamt I was in a new destroyed urban landscape, wreathed in barbed wire from which to continue my quest. Sometime after Hassan and Abbas came home in black coffins, the market stopped selling vegetables altogether, and I remember Mama sobbing into her hands when she couldn't find tomatoes for another month. Those days were the hardest, and I stopped hoping for snake oil for a while. If we could not find a green pepper, let alone the meat to stuff it with, how was I possibly to find the elusive oil? Eventually, Um Hamza's family relocated after being a plot of land. After, sorry, after being given a plot of land from Saddam as compensation, and I felt like I'd missed my opportunity all those years ago, never, never having asked her if she could find me some snake oil. The war dragged on with nothing but obstin obstinacy and bodies to, to sustain it. The year before it ended, my bags were packed and I was waiting for Uncle Mehdi to take me to the airport in his old Chevrolet. I heard Mama put down the phone, interrupting the sound of Maha's gurgling daughter. She joined me at the corrugated tin of our front gate, leaning defeated back against it and cupping my chin in the palm of her vain hand. Amman wasn't far. 
But, as Mama repeated, only God knows what is written. Um, Hamza sends you all her love, she said in a tired voice, as though the bark from a date palm had got caught in her throat. Time had spun a nest around her body in the intervening 18 year, dream years, and she looked weary. Her grandson just died in the war. You remember, the one with the pet lamb. I nodded. We were all dulled by the slaughter now. She's at her daughter-in-law's house. Apparently, her people are saying that we should never wear silver with gold and that sesame oil makes the hair grow down to the ground. Mama let, a let out a quiet laugh as she straightened her dishdasha at the sound of the approaching car. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sina, Sansantika. Um, just want to give another round of applause to all eight of our readers, our four fellows, and their mentors. Incredible night of readings. Thank you so much. So we're going to close out tonight. Um, we've got celebratory cake in the back. It's in the back room. We've got three types of cake, including gluten and dairy-free cupcakes. Um, so please help yourselves. We also still have chat books, which you can get signed by our amazing fellows. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Really, really appreciate it. A big round of applause for everybody here. <laughs> Woo! And stick around, hang out. Please come and talk to all of our writers. Get your...